Section 32 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 32. Catherine of Russia. Part 1. Why, I can smile and murder while I smile, and cry content to that which grieves my heart, and wet my cheek with artificial tears, and frame my face for all occasions. Shakespeare The long and conspicuous reign of Catherine the Second was one of great tragical interest, and signalized by memorable events. Her mind was subtle and vigorous, but it is impossible to regard her character with any other feelings than those of disgust and pity. She presented herself to the world under a mask of benevolence, sincerity, wisdom, and piety, beneath which lurked detestable hypocrisy, licentiousness, vanity, and an ambition that aspired to great actions and reforms for the sake of renown rather than the good of mankind. Anxious to outfigure her great predecessors in the eyes of posterity, she selected her historian, and charged him not to record the assistance of any one in the accomplishment of certain events, but to give the entire credit to her own wisdom and courage. She would have succeeding generations accept her as a model empress. She, who began her reign with the secret assassination of three rightful heirs to the throne, and ended it with the unjust and execrable division of Poland. In order to understand the steps by which she, a comparatively obscure princess, acquired the crown of the Russias, it is necessary to refer to the reign of her immediate predecessor. Elizabeth, the youngest daughter of Peter the Great, was proclaimed empress in 1741 by means of a revolt which deposed her cousin Anne and the infant Prince Ivan, for whom she acted as regent. The unfortunate Ivan was immured in the dungeon of Schlüsselburg, and his parents imprisoned in a fortress on the shores of the Arctic Ocean. Although Elizabeth was an amiable, gentle, beautiful woman, possessed of winning manners and a humanity that prompted her to take a vow, never to put a subject to death upon any provocation whatever, yet through the influence of favorites and the intoxication of unlimited power, her reign was marked by injustice and atrocious cruelties, and she became timid, weak, intemperate, and notoriously licentious. She selected for her successor, Peter, the son of her eldest sister. In order to have him under her immediate superintendence, she caused him to be brought from Holstein where his education was progressing under the enlightened Brumner. By some strange caprice, she supplied him with a narrow-minded, illiterate tutor, and to prevent any revolution in his favor, kept him almost a prisoner, surrounded by spies and ignorant persons, who engaged him in amusements and frivolous occupations that assisted to suppress whatever talent and vigor or energy of character he possessed. Some estimable persons and ladies of the court at Petersburg remonstrated with the Empress for her singular treatment of one who should be better fitted to occupy the throne, but she turned a deaf ear to their intercessions. One of her attendants ventured to suggest the evil that such an education was producing upon the character of the Grand Duke. "'If your Majesty,' said this courageous friend, do not permit the prince to know anything of what is necessary for governing the country. What do you think will become of him? And what do you think will become of the empire? Elizabeth, turning sternly to her attendant, said in a measured, threatening tone, Joanna, knowest thou the road to Siberia? These words were sufficient to silence future remonstrances. In 1747, Elizabeth determined to select a spouse for Peter. She was guided in her choice by the King of Prussia, who recommended a daughter of the Prince of Anhalt-Zerbst. 
she was inclined to look favorably upon this alliance from the fact that she had once sincerely loved an uncle of the princess and after his death resolved never to marry princess sophia augusta frederica was born at stettin may second seventeen twenty nine her father was commander-in-chief in the prussian service and governor of the town and fortress of stettin her mother was a woman of distinguished beauty prudence and good sense she took upon herself the education of sophia who received the familiar nickname of fique among her companions these were selected without reference to their rank for her mother endeavored to cultivate the simplest manners to suppress pride a predominant characteristic of sophia and to insist upon her respectfully saluting ladies of distinction who visited the house among her playfellows she invariably took the principal part often bringing into exercise an imperious commanding temper she was educated in the lutheran religion was early instructed from the best authors and was disposed to study and reflection her seclusion was occasionally varied by excursions and visits to hamburg and berlin in company with her mother these visits fitted her for an after appearance at court at the suggestion of the king of prussia the princess of zerbst repaired to petersburg with her daughter hoping by means of sophia's attractions and the reminiscences of elizabeth's affection for her brother to secure an alliance with peter they were cordially received by the empress the grand duke was quickly an admirer of the young princess who now in her sixteenth year added lively manners to an agreeable if not handsome face she as readily regarded him favorably for at this time his countenance was fresh good-humored and pleasing and his person of good stature and finely formed with such mutual good will therefore but little time was required to make and accept proposals of marriage as a necessary preliminary sophia adopted the greek religion and received the name of catherine alexiana magnificent preparations were made for the approaching nuptials but in the midst of this fair sailing the grand duke was attacked with a violent fever which soon divulged a malignant form of the smallpox he recovered in a few weeks but his face was for some time distorted and actually hideous with the marks of a disease which disfigured him for life catherine who had been carefully kept in distant apartments was prepared by her mother for the change in the appearance of her royal lover and warned not to betray the aversion she might feel on seeing him lest the fine air castles they had been building should be blown away at a breath catherine promised to conceal her emotions and attired as becomingly as possible was conducted to the presence of the grand duke she played her part well with consummate art she approached peter in her usual lively and graceful way threw her arms about his neck and kissed his cheek apparently with devoted affection she had no sooner gained her own apartments however than she fell senseless and remained unconscious for three hours this extreme repugnance which she had so successfully dissembled did not interfere for a moment with the ambitious designs that already outweighed every other consideration the marriage was accordingly solemnized in seventeen forty seven catherine retained an outward show of affection and respect as long as she thought necessary but she soon felt her decided superiority talented accomplished speaking several languages with facility dignified and winning in her deportment she easily and becomingly filled her distinguished position while peter who had good sense and a kind confiding heart had been spoiled by a base education lacked polish and intelligence and blushed at his inferiority in the presence of his wife he regarded her with pride and admired the facility and fitness with which she acted the grand duchess determined to overrule and deprive him of the expected succession by placing the crown upon her own brow she was easily induced to engage in the conspiracies formed against him by persons who preferred to see the ambitious catherine upon the throne 
every possible means were taken to blacken the character of the Grand Duke in the eyes of Elizabeth. Slanderous reports were daily conveyed to her by one of her ladies of honor, who was engaged in the intrigues of the court. On one occasion, when she lamented the intemperate habits of the prince, the empress, shocked at this new charge, insisted she would not believe it till proved. The artful attendant took the first opportunity to dine with Peter, and by secretly putting an opiate in his wine, succeeded in prevailing upon him to unconsciously drink to excess. When he was sufficiently intoxicated, the deceitful woman hastened to call the empress. Bestuchev, the great chancellor, superintended these maneuvers by writing directions each day on scraps of paper, indicating the course of conduct each interested person was to pursue. These he enclosed in a snuff-box with a double bottom, and, under pretense of offering snuff, succeeded in conveying them to those for whom they were intended without observation. Soon after the marriage of Peter, the Empress presented him with the palace of Oranienbaum, at some distance from Petersburg. There he preferred to remain, in freedom from his aunt's continual scrutiny and reproaches. For his amusement, he formed a guard of Holstein soldiers, and instructed them for several hours each day in the Prussian exercises. He also gathered about him those who had talent for music or the drama, besides a number of dissipated companions. Knowing his passion for imitating everything Prussian, they persuaded him to gamble, drink, and engage in other vices, assuring him that every officer in Prussia did the same. In the meantime, Catherine, wearied with the solitude of this country palace, and entertaining no affection for her husband, received the admiration of Soltikoff, the prince's chamberlain, a man of polished address and attractive appearance. Elizabeth soon heard the consequent scandal, and made her displeasure evident, though not fitted to reprove the misconduct for which she was notorious herself. By artful representations, Catherine was reinstated in her favor. But the Empress had frequent occasions to reprimand both of her belligerent wards, and seemed seriously to think of appointing Paul, the infant son of Catherine, her successor, with a regent to reign during his minority. Fearing this, Catherine assiduously applied herself to regaining the good will of the Empress, exalted herself in the eyes of the people by attending church daily with a devout air during the illness of the Empress, and assisted the intriguing party that favored her schemes by placing Peter in an odious light before the courtiers and the populace. At Elizabeth's death, which occurred early in 1762, in a fit of intoxication, she was made to repeat words of the attending priest that expressed affection for the Grand Duke and Duchess, and named them her successors. As soon as the royal message reached Peter, which commanded him to live long, the Russian form of announcing death, he passed in state through the streets of Petersburg, causing himself to be proclaimed emperor under the name of Peter the Third. Notwithstanding the contempt which the conspirators had sought to bring upon him, he was enthusiastically received by the people. He began his reign with popular measures. One of his first acts was to recall a multitude of state prisoners exiled to Siberia by the tyrannical and suspicious temper of Elizabeth. He took no revenge upon his enemies, permitted the nobility to travel abroad at their pleasure, and allowed them to join the military service or not as they chose. He also abolished the secret tribunal which had long been a terror to the Russians. Everyone was in transports of delight with the new emperor, who had suddenly become a wise, dignified, temperate prince. His affection for Catherine returned and he treated her with the utmost kindness and attention, forgetting her unfaithfulness and coldness. She, however, withheld the advice and guidance she was capable of giving, and which Peter looked for. Wearied with her repulsive coldness and imperious harshness, surrounded by a deceitful court, with not a single friend to whom he could turn with confidence, 
and bewildered with cares for which his education and life had not prepared him, he returned to his vicious habits, unable, with his blunt perceptions, to detect or even suspect the conspiracies formed against him. In fact, he was too much engaged in plots of his own to perceive that any others were in progress. Jealous and suspicious of his wife, he had thoughts of displacing her and her heir, and naming for his successor Prince Ivan, who, for more than twenty years, had been immured in a dungeon. Peter secretly visited the unhappy prince, and soon after had him brought privately to Petersburg, and concealed in an obscure house. Catherine, whom Peter had dismissed to the palace of Peterhof, occupied her leisure and retirement in instigating and perfecting plots against the emperor, while she appeared to take no part of them. The Princess Dashkov, then only eighteen, quick, witty, courageous, learned, and with remarkable talent for intrigue, remained at court for the purpose of keeping Catherine informed of every circumstance that transpired. It was not only an attachment to the Empress that induced her to such a course, but jealousy towards a sister who was the openly acknowledged favorite of the Emperor, and a base ambition to be the leader of a faction. The other principal personages were Count Panin, preceptor to the young prince, a man of obscure birth, and a character in which obstinacy and cunning were predominant. Gregory Orloff, Catherine's last lover, noted for courage and beauty, and his brother Alexei, both of them officers in the guards. Another, Cyril Razmanovsky, the hetman or commander of the Cossacks, having much influence at court, and possessed of immense wealth, besides being a favorite among the troops, was an important assistant. By the secret machinations of all these haughty heads put together, the conspiracy was ripe for execution. Peter the Third, who was nearly ready to put himself at the head of a waiting army destined to war against Denmark, was to be seized on his arrival at Peterhof, where he expected to celebrate a festival previous to his departure for Denmark. He was now engaged in revels at his country palace of Oranienbaum. Catherine, meanwhile, lived in daily fear and unendurable anxiety, lest her schemes should be discovered. Even her dreams were haunted with guilty terrors. She frequently paced the floor of her apartments half the night, for sleep fled from her frightened eyelids. An unexpected occurrence hastened the execution of the conspirators' designs. Pasek, a lieutenant in the guards, had gained the soldiers of his company. One of them, supposing nothing was done without the concurrence of the captain, innocently asked him on what day they were to take up arms against the emperor. The captain concealed his surprise, and cunningly drew from the unsuspecting soldier the whole secret. Pasek was immediately arrested and put under guard, but he managed to write hastily upon a slip of paper, Proceed to execution this instant, or we are undone, and gave it to a spy, who hurried it to the Princess Dashkov. She quickly informed the conspirators, and though late at night, she assumed man's apparel and went out to meet them upon an unfrequented bridge where their plans were quickly formed. The Empress had vacated the palace at Peterhof to leave the apartments free for the festival. She occupied a summer house in the garden of the palace, at the extremity of which was a canal connected with the Neva, that gave private access to the gardens by means of a small boat fastened there. Catherine was sleeping here at midnight when she was suddenly aroused and beheld a soldier standing at her bedside. "'Your Majesty has not a moment to lose. Get ready to follow me,' said he. Terrified and astonished, the Empress arose, called her attendant Ivanovna, and dressed in haste. The soldier returned for them. They followed him to a carriage that stood waiting and found Alexei Orlov, impatient for their appearance. The Empress and her maid were placed in the vehicle. Alexei took the reins and set off at full speed for Petersburg, twenty miles distant. Suddenly the horses stopped and fell down, and no efforts of Alexei and his companion could urge them on. Their danger was every moment increasing. It was still night, 
and several miles were yet to be traversed. The empress was finally obliged to leave the carriage, and they resolved to pursue their way on foot. Impatient to reach the city, and filled with terror, they fled rather than walked along the road, not knowing what moment they might be pursued. They had not gone far before they met a light country cart. Alexey Orlov seized the poor peasant's horses, and the empress and her maid sprang into the rough vehicle. Leaving the owner standing aghast in the middle of the road, they sped away to the capital. Catherine, worn out with fatigue and excitement, arrived at seven in the morning, but without taking rest, proceeded to the quarter of the soldiers. Seeing but few who issued from the barracks with clamorous greeting, she hesitated a moment, trembling. An instant's thought suggested a deception by which to gain the whole detachment. In a speech, she assured them that the Tsar, her husband, had attempted to murder her and her son that very night. She had just escaped, and now threw herself on their protection. The incensed soldiers, believing what she said, swore to defend her. The cry of, Long live the Empress Catherine, went up with enthusiastic demonstrations. The Orloffs secured a like reception from their regiments, and no one dared to stop the singular proceedings except Villebois, general of the artillery, who attempted to remonstrate. Catherine turned round, and, in an imperious tone, demanded what he intended to do. Confused and confounded with her commanding manner, he could only stammer out, "'To obey your majesty!' and immediately delivered the arsenals and magazines of the city into her hands. It had required but two hours to accomplish this feat, and, without bloodshed, Catherine saw herself surrounded by two thousand warriors, besides the inhabitants of Petersburg, who imitated the movements of the soldiers. In the afternoon she repaired to the church of Kafen, where the Archbishop of Novgorod, in sacerdotal robes, accompanied by numerous priests wearing long beards, was ready to receive her at the altar. He placed the crown upon her head, proclaimed her the sovereign of the Russias as Catherine II, and the Grand Duke Paul Petrovich her successor. The shouts of the multitude who crowded the church were hushed by the chant of the Te Deum that solemnly swelled above the vast assemblage. The ceremony concluded the empress repaired to the palace that had been occupied by Elizabeth, and for several hours received the crowds who thronged the apartments to take the oath of allegiance. The Chancellor Varensov, father of the Princess Dashkov, but a firm adherent to the emperor's cause, ventured to warn Catherine of the danger to which she exposed herself. She replied with insulting impudence and hypocritical innocence, "'You see how it is?' I cannot really do otherwise. I am only yielding to the ardent sensibility of the nation. The Chancellor was attended to his own house by a guard. At six in the evening, Catherine, crowned with oak leaves and with a sword in her hand, mounted her horse, and accompanied by Princess Dashkov and the Hetman Razmunovsky, placed herself at the head of the troops at Petersburg and went out to meet those who were encamped at a distance, in order to secure their adherence before Peter should command their attendance upon himself. During all these rapid and singular movements, Peter the Third, in unsuspecting ignorance, set out for the expected festivities of Peterhof, with the ladies and courtiers who had been reveling at his palace at Oranienbaum. While riding gaily along the road to Peterhof, they were met by one of Catherine's attendants, who said the empress had escaped and was nowhere to be found. Peter, confounded and unbelieving, hastened to the palace, searched the apartments, fled from one place to another in the greatest fright, questioned all whom he met, but was unable to solve the mystery. While all about him were filled with gloomy forebodings, a countryman rode rapidly up to the group, made a profound inclination of the body, and without uttering a word, drew from the bosom of his caftan a sealed note, and presented it to the emperor. 
This revealed the occurrences at Petersburg and his wife's duplicity. The terror of the emperor increased every moment, but the tears of the women about him and the advice of his young courtiers availed him nothing. Munich, whom he had released from exile in Siberia, presented himself and suggested the only practicable course to pursue, telling him to put himself at the head of such troops as were left and march to Petersburg, where the sight of the emperor might effect a counter-revolution. But the news that Catherine, with her army, was already marching towards Peterhof, so frightened the cowardly emperor that he accepted the last advice of Munich, threw himself into a yacht, precipitately followed by the weeping women and unmanly courtiers, and went to Kronstadt, an important port in the Gulf of Finland, which Munich knew would afford him ample means of defense if the inhabitants and garrison still adhered to the emperor's cause. Catherine had been too quick for them. They no sooner arrived in port than the sentinels cried out, Who comes there? The emperor, was the reply. Long live the Empress Catherine, rang out from the soldiers, who threatened to sink the yacht if they did not put off in an instant. Munich entreated Peter to spring upon shore, and all might yet be his. But, like a terrified child, he ran into the cabin and hid himself among the terrified women. Nothing could be done but row the infatuated imbecile prince back to Oranienbaum. End of section 32「Section 33 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 33. Catherine of Russia. Part 2. Here he wrote a letter to the Empress, promising submission and acknowledging his misconduct. She deigned him no answer, but with her army approached his palace. At first he ordered a horse, intending to fly to the frontiers of Poland, but, always irresolute, he changed his plan and directed his fortress to be dismantled and his Holstein guard to retire to a distance, that Catherine might be touched by his entire surrender. She caused him to be seized, however, and placed in close confinement till he wrote and signed a declaration that he was not capable of reigning, and that he voluntarily abdicated the throne. Even this did not serve to secure his liberty. The same night he was conducted by a strong guard to Ropecha, a small imperial palace about fourteen miles from Petersburg. In despair at his sad prospects of imprisonment, he sent a message to Catherine, entreating her to send an old negro buffoon who had often amused him, a favorite dog, his violin, a Bible, and a few romances. She maintained a scornful silence. Catherine had been crowned empress. She had published a manifesto, declaring her motives to have been a tender love for her people and anxiety for the preservation of the holy Greek religion. She had used every means to beguile and deceive the troops who were necessary to her success, but she still felt insecure. She was alarmed at the murmurings and resistance of various distant towns and cities, which would have declared for Peter the Third had he succeeded in presenting himself before them. A career of guilt, once commenced, leads to manifold crimes. Probably Catherine, in her first design of seizing the throne, had no thought of imbruing her hands in the blood of those who, as descendants of Peter the Great, and rightful heirs to the throne, were revered in the eyes of the people. Harassed by constant fears of insurrection, and unwilling to resign what she had so dexterously grasped, she listened to the whispered suggestions of the fiendish courtiers who had thus far assisted her, and connived at, or at least did not prevent, the assassination of Peter the Third, in order to remove one so obnoxious to her repose. 
This act was accomplished with such secrecy and deception that the emperor's disappearance long remained a mystery, though no one hesitated to cast suspicion on Catherine. The revolting details have since been revealed. Alexei Orloff, noted for his strength and brutality, undertook with two companions the execution of the deed. Seven days after the empress had been crowned, which occurred June 28, 1762, Alexei repaired to the palace where Peter was confined, and, as he had often done before, dined with the emperor. Lieutenant Pasek, who was present, assisted him in introducing poison into the wine poured out for Peter. The unsuspecting emperor drank freely, and presently was seized with violent pain. Recognizing the design, he called for milk to allay his sufferings, and mingling his cries of agony with reproaches. They again pressed him to swallow more of the fatal beverage, but he resisted with all his strength. His valet, hearing the noise, rushed in. Peter threw himself in his arms, exclaiming faintly, "'It was not enough to deprive me of the throne of Russia. I must now be murdered!' The valet attempted to defend him, but Orloff, with his giant strength, easily thrust him from the room, and returned to his victim. The emperor fought with the strength of despair, but after a fierce and terrible struggle he was thrown to the floor, and strangled with a napkin snatched from the dinner-table. Alexei Orloff immediately mounted his horse and rode at full speed to Petersburg to inform the Empress. On his arrival, he found her just going to make her appearance at court. She maintained her composure, ease, and usual gaiety, dined in public, and in the evening again held a court. The following day, while she was dining with the foreign ministers and a few courtiers, a messenger was ushered in with great ceremony, and announced the tidings of the Emperor's death. Catherine immediately arose from table, and with her handkerchief at her eyes, hastened to shut herself in her own apartments, where she remained for several days, as if overwhelmed with sorrow. During that time, she caused a manifesto to be published which, after mentioning his illness, declared that, in obedience to the divine command by which we are enjoined to preserve the life of our neighbor, we ordered that Peter should be furnished with everything that might be judged necessary to restore his health. It also expressed her great affliction. But despite this fabric of falsehoods and Catherine's artful assumption of grief, no one was so stupid as to believe what she asserted, though no one dared say a word upon the matter and that was all the Empress wished. The remains of Peter were brought to the capital and buried with great pomp. Her next movement was to send Ivan back to prison, and at the same time she gave orders to put him to death if any attempt was made to deliver him. There were many who sympathized with the unfortunate prince, fated to spend a lifetime, from infancy to manhood, in dungeons and fortresses, where he was subjected to every manner of suffering. Ivan is described as having fine light hair, regular features, an extremely fair complexion, a figure of commanding height and fine proportions, and a voice sweet and touchingly mournful in its accents. A conspiracy was set on foot to rescue him and place him upon the throne, headed by an officer named Mirovich who forced his way into the fortress of Schlüsselburg, where Ivan was confined, determined to deliver him. The guards immediately assassinated the defenseless prince and flung his body before Mirovich, who immediately threw down his sword and surrendered. All who were engaged in this conspiracy were imprisoned, knouted, or sent to Siberia. Catherine, now relieved of those who could cause her the most uneasiness, turned her attention to measures which would secure the applause of her subjects and give her the fame she was ambitious to gain abroad. She no longer needed the services of the Princess Dashkoff, who had become odious to her, notwithstanding her sacrifices of family and of herself in the cause of her friend. Catherine was not capable of friendship. 
She made tools of those whom she flattered with her confidence. Princess Dashkov, in the beginning of the revolution, had put on the uniform of the guards, and now asked, as a recompense for her services, the title of colonel of a regiment. To this the empress scornfully replied that, the academy would suit her better than a military corps. The princess resented her ingratitude, and spoke of it among her friends, with the bold independence natural to her. But for such imprudence she was ordered to retire to Moscow. The Archbishop of Novgorod, who had also materially assisted in Catherine's designs, was disappointed in his expected reward, and dismissed with a warning as to how he vented his rage. These, and similar occurrences, caused discontent and irritation among the people, which took so serious a turn that it was thought for a time Catherine would be hurled from the throne she had usurped. But her courage and presence of mind never forsook her. She inflicted such terrible punishments upon the ringleaders as effectively prevented any farther demonstrations of dissatisfaction. Among the first acts of her reign was the confirmation of the two principal edicts of her predecessor, which had given him such popularity at his accession. But she took good care to appropriate all the credit to herself. With a policy that consulted the low state of the finances, she also ratified the treaties that had been made with Denmark and Prussia. By thus securing peace, she was enabled to turn her attention to the improvement and aggrandizement of Russia. She instituted many wise and admirable regulations that secured the highest encomiums from other nations, though it is said she was undeserving her celebrity as a lawgiver, since her famous code consisted of a tissue of paragraphs taken principally from Montesquieu's Esprit de Loi and Beccaria's Treatise on Crime and Punishment and other well-known writers. She laid claim to her code as having originated it herself and complacently received the adulations of all Europe. She certainly deserves credit, however, for her energy and skill in devising and prosecuting arrangements for the founding of colleges and hospitals on a grand scale in the principal cities, for the establishment of a foundling and lying-in hospital under the most benevolent and salutary regulations, and for the magnificent seminaries she endowed at Petersburg, one for the education of five hundred young ladies, the other a military school for young men, both of which are still the pride of Petersburg. She also invited foreigners from every country, whether professional or scientific men, artisans, mechanics, or common laborers, an invitation which quickly populated the deserts of Russia with a host who loudly murmured their discontent after they arrived and regretted their foolishness in abandoning better homes. All this and more was accomplished in the first year and a half of Catherine's reign. She added to her own reputation abroad for sagacity and wisdom by assisting at all the deliberations of the councils, read the dispatches from her ambassadors, dictated or wrote the answers, and attended to all the minutiae of foreign affairs. She often had interviews with Munich, who suggested to her the plan of driving the Turks from Constantinople, and with Bestuchev, a man of profound policy, who had the experience of Grand Chancellor in Elizabeth's reign, and who kept Catherine informed of the politics and resources of the European courts. In her interviews with foreign ministers, she assured them of her independence and courage, told them the world must not judge of her yet, that she had scarcely begun her reign, and would surprise Europe in time with her great exploits, and assured them she should behave with the princes of other nations like a finished coquette. But in the midst of all her occupations, the Empress did not forget her old favorites, or neglect to find new ones. In this she imitated the profligate example of Elizabeth. Gregory Orloff, brother of Alexei, she seemed to entertain a sincere affection for, although he did not unite polished manners with beauty of person. He was ambitious, and hoped the Empress would give him her hand, and thus elevate him to the dignity of a sovereign. 
Catherine would only consent to a concealed marriage, but that was not sufficient for the haughty but low-born Gregory. Fearful she would degrade her rank by marrying a man whom everyone detested, her turbulent subjects concocted new conspiracies. While on a visit to Moscow, Catherine discovered one of these plots, and, alarmed for her safety, returned immediately to Petersburg, entering that city with a pompous and magnificent display, which she intended should awe the disaffected. She believed that the Princess Dashkoff influenced some of these intrigues, and determined to conceal the dislike she bore her, and invited her to court again. She wrote a flattering and deceitful letter, asking her knowledge of the conspiracies, which was not calculated, however, to blind the quick-witted princess, who had too much occasion to know Catherine's artfulness to trust her words. To the long and affectionate letter of the Empress, the wounded friend replied with daring haughtiness in a few words, Madam, wrote she, I have heard nothing, but if I had heard anything, I should take good care how I spoke of it. What is it you require of me, that I should expire on a scaffold? I am ready to mount it. Catherine was chagrined at this display of spirit, but did not take revenge, and left the princess in disgrace to travel about Europe. She everywhere attracted attention by her singular and bold manners. After her anger towards the empress had subsided, she returned to Russia, and Catherine, thinking it best to conciliate one so cognizant of her crimes, appointed her president of the academy. Here she presided with the whims and temper of a virago, deprived the professors of fuel in winter from avaricious motives, and commanded them as she would have done a regiment of soldiers. Wrapped in rich furs, she seated herself in the midst of the shivering professors, dictating to them what they knew better than she, till they were tempted to abandon the country where the empress was content to have but the shell of science and literature without the colonel. Renown was Catherine's sole aim, for that she continued to endow colleges and academies of science and art, which often proceeded no further than the selection of a site, or, if they were built, rarely afforded anything besides opportunities for grand and bombastic speeches from the empress. She encouraged the arts, inviting artists to her court, and paid most extravagant prices for pictures, though without the least taste to judge of their merits or defects. Her end was accomplished, however, so long as the recipients of her generous encouragement sounded her fame. Many of the pictures decorated the walls of her palace, being fitted together without frames, so as to cover on each side the whole of the walls without the slightest attention to disposition or general effect. When a place could not conveniently be filled, the pictures were cut to suit the vacancy. Catherine prided herself upon the generosity of her gifts to those who visited her court, and to those who performed important services. She maintained a magnificence in her movements and decorations that exceeded all the courts of Europe, and added to the glory of her achievements by founding cities as well as colleges, which those who visited her vainly looked for. Many of them were never to be found, for the very good reason that she was satisfied to designate a site, give a name, and see it swell the list of her boasted cities, though it after all existed only in her imagination. Joseph the Second once accompanied her to lay the foundations of a new city. On his return he dryly remarked, The Empress and I have this day achieved a great work. She has laid the first stone of a great city, and I have laid the last. He was just in his surmise. The city can nowhere be found except upon some of the maps of Russia. While thus engaged at home, she did not neglect to increase her power abroad. Poland, for many years, had gradually extended its possessions by the intermarriage of Polish princesses with the heirs of royal domains in Russia. Catherine, therefore, in a measure, ruled the election of kings in that republic. Upon the death of Augustus III, she contrived, partly by the force of arms and partly by cunning policy, 
to secure the election of one of her old favorites, Count Poniasovsky, a man who is described as having but small capacity to govern, rather weak than gentle, possessing a mind that was better calculated to shine in social intercourse than to sway men of cultivation. Tall, well-made, of a figure at once commanding and agreeable, he could more skillfully play the lover than the courtier. He was rather forced upon than accepted by the Poles, who loudly murmured at the accession of one who was neither distinguished by birth nor any brilliant achievements. Soon after his election, difficulties commenced in Poland which, by causing innumerable divisions of parties, weakened and exposed it to the rapacious robbery of Russia and Prussia. In 1563, a law had been passed which granted equal rights to all religious persuasions, whether Greek, Lutheran, or Catholic. In 1763, however, the Catholics had obtained a decided superiority, and excluded from the Diets all those who did not adopt their faith. This occasioned serious contention. The various parties received the name of dissidents, and applied to Russia for assistance in claiming their rights. Catherine sent an army, under the command of Prince Repuin, who immediately seized the principal persons in the Diet and exiled them to Siberia. The king himself, through the instigation of Orloff, was treated with great indignity. Prince Repuin commanded like a despot in Warsaw, and the Poles began to be amazed at the dangerous assistance they had sought, and beheld their country overrun with Russian soldiery, from whom they had no power to extricate themselves. They could only submit to the terms the Empress chose to grant them. She already proposed the recovery of those parts of Poland which had been annexed from Russia, but her plans were not yet fully formed. She contented herself for a few years to use her domineering influence over a nation that she was in honor bound to protect and not to oppress. In 1768, Turkey declared war against Russia in consequence of the oppression of Poland. The latter, suffering all the horrors of a war partly civil, partly religious, and partly foreign, and its haughty brave nobles, unwilling to brook the outrages of Russia, applied to Turkey for relief. Catherine, with undaunted courage, accepted the challenge, prepared an army and powerful fleets, and speedily sent them against her enemies. While they gained victories along the Danube, the Pruth, and sailed triumphant on the Yuxin, Catherine was occupied at home in vast preparations to attack them even in the isles of Greece. Her dockyards were filled with workmen who busily constructed ships of war. Her cities resounded with the clang of metal, molded and shaped into death-dealing weapons by the hands of skillful artisans. Her politicians were engaged in exciting debates as to the expediency of the undertaking. Her foreign ministers and emissaries were directed to secure the non-interference of other nations and permission to enter their ports. Her fleets were manned not only by the most experienced officers of her own empire, but notable Englishmen, Danes, and Dutch were enlisted in her service. Admiral Spiridov commanded the fleet, but he and all the armies were under the orders of Alexei Orlov, who had been appointed general. While these fleets and armies were sweeping victoriously through the archipelago and harassing the borders of the Turkish Empire, Catherine, always industrious in intrigues, kept up a secret correspondence with Frederick of Prussia pertaining to Poland. They mediated the partition of that nation. An interview, however, was necessary to perfect the design. Unwilling that other monarchs should discover their infamous intentions, and knowing their motives could not be concealed if an ostentatious visit was made by either party, they decided to resort to stratagem. Prince Henry, the brother of Frederick, received instructions to go to Russia with full powers to concert the desired measures with the Empress. It was given out that he intended making a visit to his sister, Queen of Sweden, and should return to Prussia by way of Denmark. While at Stockholm, he received pressing invitations from Catherine to visit her at Petersburg, 
in which she expressed her anxiety to entertain so illustrious a prince. As if it had not all been managed beforehand, Henry expressed unexpected pleasure, and with an apparent change of his plans set out for Petersburg, accompanied by a brilliant suite. He was received with flattering attentions by the minister, Count Penin, and conducted in great state to the palace prepared for him. The first day of his arrival was passed with the most ceremonious etiquette, after which a series of entertainments were given that in magnificence outdid all the courts of Europe. One of these entertainments was given at the summer palace called Zarskoselo. It was situated at a distance of twenty-four versts, or sixteen miles, from Petersburg, in an open country, diversified with low, picturesque hills and forests. The road to it was lighted by more than a thousand lamps, and every verst marked by a column of marble, jasper, or granite. All along there were views of elegant country seats and gardens, Gothic palaces with their lofty towers and turrets, Chinese temples crested upon high artificial rocks, villages built in the same style, fanciful bridges, and every other device by which the route could be made attractive and enchanting. The palace itself was immense and dazzling. Within and without were profuse gilded ornaments. Every portion of the interior was fitted up in the richest and costliest style. The extensive gardens were ornamented by artificial lakes dotted with charming wooded islands, from one of which rose a Turkish mosque, from another an elegant structure for musical performances, while from others shot up tall columns or Egyptian pyramids, miniature towns and villages, a hermitage, superb baths and picturesque ruins, completed this luxurious resort that, springing up in the midst of the bleak deserts of Russia, was the realization of a Titania's kingdom. To this magnificent and showy palace the Empress conducted Prince Henry in an immense sledge, followed by two thousand others containing a great number of ladies and the nobility, all in masks and fancy dresses. The ornaments along the road consisted of some novel display at every verst, fireworks in every possible variety and unimagined beauty, houses built to represent the style of different nations and enlivened with people dressed in corresponding costumes, shepherds and shepherdesses exhibiting national dances, and, at a little distance from the palace, an artificial volcano representing an eruption of Mount Vesuvius. The festivities at the palace were equally ingenious and startling. At table, everything was arranged with such magician-like effect that when one wished to change his plate, he had but to tap the center, and it fell through the table and floor, and was immediately replaced by another that came up by the same means, replenished with whatever he desired. End of section 33thirty four of the heroines of history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by christine h the heroines of history by john s jenkins section thirty four catherine of russia part three by such displays Catherine sought to amuse her royal guest, and blind her subjects and the world at large, as to the secret purpose which all this show successfully masked. Henry looked on without appearing to be in the least diverted. He maintained a sober and dignified bearing, looking on the frivolous and expensive sports as mere child's play, but covered his disdain under an air of abstracted indifference. His dress and appearance occasioned infinite amusement to the Russians. His hair was worn in a high toupee, and his apparel sometimes consisted of a light blue frock with silver frogs, a red waistcoat, and blue breeches. In his interviews with Catherine, their disguised intentions were cautiously discussed. They decided upon the dismemberment of Poland, and Henry went so far as to assign to Austria, Turkey, Prussia, and Russia, 
the spoils which should fall to the share of each. Catherine promised to frighten Turkey and flatter England into acquiescence. Said she, Do you take upon you to buy over Austria, that she may amuse France? Thus did this unscrupulous monarch devise and carry out a robbery, with as hypocritical and innocent a face as had carried her through the connived assassination of her husband. The treaty, however, was not signed for some years. Soon after Henry's departure, early in 1771, Count Alexei Orloff returned from his victories, laden with triumphant laurels, which fixed upon him the eyes of all Russia. He received honors and titles from his sovereign, and in the succeeding festivities resigned his giant strength to the ease and repose of courtly luxury. His ferocity, cruelty, and coarseness of manner were better fitted for the horrors of war than the refinement and etiquette of court. His huge arm knew better how to strike the assassin's blow than to shield the unfortunate. His soul was in its most grateful element when reveling in the consciousness of a victim's torment. At his request, Catherine provided him with ample means to prosecute his conquests in the archipelago. He left Petersburg, loaded with assurances of the favor of the Empress, and went to join the squadron prepared for him at Leghorn. While in Italy, he executed a commission from the Empress, requiring two pictures to be painted in representation of the burning of the Turkish fleet in the previous expedition. Orloff did not hesitate to have a score of ships in the harbor set on fire or blown up, in order that the painter might do justice to his subject. He had another commission from Catherine, which he performed with equal villainy. She had reason to fear the entire downfall of her throne as long as any descendants of Peter the Great existed. One remained, upon whom her eye was fixed. With her usual secrecy and false-heartedness, she laid a snare for the fair and unsuspecting girl whose shadow was a hateful ghost in the pathway of the guilty empress. The empress Elizabeth, by a clandestine marriage with Razumovsky, had three children, the youngest a girl, named Princess Tarakanov, and protected by the Polish prince Radzivill. He conveyed her to Rome, where she had been educated and kept in seclusion under the care of a watchful governess. Alexei Orloff succeeded in ferreting out her concealment, and by the most devoted attention and deceitful representations, won the affections of the princess and obtained her consent to a marriage. The ceremony was performed by villains in the disguise of priests. The innocent and confiding Tarakanov, believing him to be her veritable husband, accompanied him to Pisa, where a sumptuous palace was prepared for her reception. He was constantly at her side, in order to prevent anyone from instilling suspicion into her mind. She accepted his attentions as proof of his affection, and returned it with a fond tenderness that with her youth and beauty would have swerved any heart but his from its cruel purpose. Several days passed in festivities, when the princess asked to see the Russian fleet that was soon to convey away the count. He was delighted to gratify her, and accordingly she was escorted to a boat prepared with magnificent awnings to receive her, and accompanied by a suite of ladies and several Russian officers, put off from the shore in the midst of enthusiastic shouts and lively strains of music. Arrived at one of the principal ships, a splendid chair was lowered that she might, without inconvenience, be conveyed on board. Amused with the novelty, she stepped gaily on deck, but was immediately seized and handcuffed. Tears and entreaties were unavailing. In vain she supplicated at the feet of her betrayer. She was torn away and carried a prisoner down into the hold, and the following day conveyed to Russia. Catherine gave secret orders to confine her in the fortress of Petersburg, and it was afterwards surmised that she was drowned in her dungeons by the rising of the waters of the river that rolled at the foot of the tower walls. But her fate remained one of the whispered mysteries of the Russian court. 
In 1771, an event occurred which took the Russians by surprise, and cast an odium upon Catherine's administration that nothing could efface. The inhabitants of a province lying on the Volga, north of Astrakhan, were driven to desperation by the cruelty and injustice of the governor placed over them. They were a peaceful, hospitable people, originally from Chinese Tartary, and until within a few years had preserved their independence. Their religion and customs continued unchanged. They roamed about the steppes with their usual aversion to permanent dwellings, and also from the necessity of furnishing herbage for their hordes of cattle. Much oppression from the emissaries of the Empress, and an unheard-of indignity offered to a venerable old man, greatly beloved by his tribe, so incensed them that they resolved to abandon the Russian dominions and return to their ancient possessions at the foot of the mountains of Tibet. A report was also circulated among them that a revered Kalmuk priest, who died three years before, had sent them a message in the name of their gods to take possession of their ancient territories. They obeyed, and in a well-ordered march went secretly and silently on their perilous journey. An immense troop, with their wives, children, and servants, hordes of cattle, goods of every description, tents, and household utensils. So noiseless had been their departure that no intimation of it whatever reached Petersburg till they had gained two days' march. Catherine immediately sent troops to arrest the fugitives, but they searched in vain through the bleak deserts till, suffering from thirst and hunger in these unwatered, barren, and depopulated regions, they were obliged to abandon the unavailing pursuit. The Chinese emperor received and protected his children, and when the exasperated empress demanded him to deliver up her runaway subjects, he scornfully refused to comply, and daringly commented on her tyranny. This Catherine never could forgive. She was used to conciliatory language from all the nations of Europe, and this bold defiance, and the dictatorial tone he used on several occasions, inspired her with a hatred that would not permit China to be favorably mentioned in her presence. Upon her application for a renewal of the treaty regarding commerce between the two nations, he provokingly replied to her envoys, Let your mistress learn to keep old treaties, and then it will be time enough to apply for new ones. Catherine could only dissemble her mortification and anger. She had not the means to punish him for his audacity, whatever were her inclinations. The war with Turkey, her policy in regard to Poland, and the equipment of extensive fleets had exhausted her treasury. Peace, however, was declared in 1774, which ceded to Catherine several provinces and gave her vessels the free navigation of the Black Sea and the archipelago. This opened an immense source of commerce and wealth to her empire. Marshal Romansov, her greatest general, received the glory of the triumphs on the borders of Turkey, and Alexei Orlov was showered with honors for his victories in the archipelago, though the credit given the latter was entirely due to the skill of the English admirals Elphinstone, Grieg, and Dugdale. While all these events were progressing, Catherine was employed at home in improving and enriching her cities and public works. Canals, connecting the several rivers in and near Petersburg, were embanked with granite. Sumptuous bridges were thrown across them, magnificent palaces were built, and public offices sprang up without number, while close beside them were squalid hovels with the most wretched occupants, and in front ran streets filled with mire and dirt. Catherine, in her palace, was the same intriguing, deceitful woman she had been in the beginning of her reign. Profligate, fitful, and tyrannical, she changed her favorites as readily as her mask, lavishing the most costly gifts upon them at one moment, and the next moment sending them into exile. She seemed to retain an affection for Gregory Orloff. She created him a prince. But Count Panin, her minister and governor of the Grand Duke Paul Petrovich, 
constantly employed his influence against the complete ascendancy of Orloff. Count Panin occupied the most important posts in the empire and continued to retain them until his death. His prosperity was probably owing more to Catherine's reliance upon his integrity than any brilliant talents she may have imagined him to possess. The admission of a new favorite, Potemkin, who gained complete rule over Catherine, drove both Panin and Orloff to despair. Count Panin absented himself from court and, it is said, died from chagrin and grief at the loss of his influence. Gregory Orloff died in the same year, 1783, at Moscow, in a state of frightful insanity. The loss of a young and beautiful wife, whom he regarded with the tenderest love, occasioned a melancholy that was deeply aggravated by the loss of the Empress' favor. His last days were spent in the ravings of delirium. He imagined that the ghost of Peter the Third was continually pursuing him with avenging darts. Thus, Catherine was relieved from the presence of two men who had assisted in elevating her to the throne, and whose dangerous possession of her secrets gave them a fearful hold over her that she was glad to shake off. Paul Petrovich was Penin's most sincere mourner. He really loved his preceptor, and with the greater strength, because his affections were driven from every object upon which he would have centered them by his tyrannical mother. She kept him under continual surveillance, and concealed him from the public eye as completely as possible, fearful of the affection entertained for him by the people, and dreading a revolution which might place him upon his rightful throne. Although arrived at manhood, he was never allowed to enter the army, or even to visit a fleet. His travels were limited, his movements closely watched and strictly reported, and Catherine always provided him with an escort of her own choosing. She condescended to select him a wife, but took good care to find one who would be too simple to engage in intrigues. He was married to a daughter of the Landgrave of Hesse-Darmstadt. As was the custom, she adopted the Greek religion and received the name of Natalia Alexierna. The Empress had reason afterwards to suspect her of engaging in political plots, and her death, which occurred a year or two after she became Grand Duchess, cast another dark imputation upon Catherine. She was scarcely cold in her grave before the Empress selected a new spouse for her son. A niece of the King of Prussia became the consort of the Grand Duke, under the name of Maria Feodorovna and with him ascended the throne twenty years afterwards. As the kings and princes of various nations had successively visited the court of Petersburg, Catherine thought she could no longer deny a return of these distinctions in permitting the Grand Duke and his bride to visit some of the courts of Europe. She confided them to the care of one of her sworn creatures, and had dispatches daily brought her by a courier, giving a minute account of everything that transpired. While at Paris, the people were more struck with Paul's excessive ugliness than anything else. One day at the Tuileries, Louis the Sixteenth asked him if he had any person in his suite who was particularly attached to him. Paul replied, with a significance which was understood by the courtiers, If my mother thought that I had but a dog belonging to me that loved me, Tomorrow it would be flung into the Seine with a stone around its neck. He was just feeling the bitterness of having a friend exiled to Siberia for life for the offense of writing to him on account of the transactions at Petersburg during his absence. It was truly a magnanimous trait in Catherine that she permitted her son to exist at all. Orloff and Penin were entirely forgotten in the brilliant reign of the favorite who had supplanted them. Potemkin was a most extraordinary man, and it was his caprices, his intense imagination, that was forever devising some unheard-of scheme, and his audacity that secured the ascendancy he obtained over Catherine as her favorite, her confidant, and her minister. The most opposite qualities were united in him, at one moment he was generous, at another avaricious, active, 
yet indolent, timid and bold, condescending and haughty, politic and indiscreet, unread yet able to astonish a scholar, an artist, artisan, or divine in conversation, promising everything but rarely performing, always chasing after some gigantic plan which he spurned in disgust when attained. Altogether he was a freak of nature, and embodied all the good and bad qualities of man, without reason or conscience to guide him. At one moment he announced his intention of becoming king of Poland, and at the next threatened to turn monk. One day he would call all the principal officers to his presence and talk of war. The next begin a series of magnificent entertainments without the least cause. He would throw all the cabinets of Europe in a ferment by his purpose of partitioning some empire, and laugh at them at his leisure, while indolently reclining among a company of ladies. Distinguished officers attended him in the capacity of servants, and he would not hesitate to dispatch one of them more than a thousand miles for a certain kind of soup that could only be made at Petersburg. Think of an officer riding thirteen hundred miles at the speed of life and death to bear a tureen of soup to his master. It was these imperious whims, his energetic will, and defiance of every obstruction to what he took it in his head to accomplish, that secured Catherine's favor. She trusted her armies to his generalship, but her historian significantly suggests, it is not to be inferred from thence that all went on well, but all went on, and the Empress desired nothing more. It was in compliance with his persuasions that Catherine was induced to visit Crimea and the other provinces that had been ceded to Russia in the treaty with the Turkish Emperor. In the beginning of 1787 she left Petersburg in grand state, accompanied by all the ladies of her suite, her favorite aide-de-camp Momonov, the French and Austrian ambassadors, all enveloped in costly furs and seated in spacious sledges by which they were conveyed with lightning rapidity over the ice and snow. Immense fires, kindled along the roads, created artificial day. At every post was an ample relay of fresh horses, and when requiring repose, they stopped at palaces built for the occasion, which equaled those at Petersburg in splendor. Here the Empress held entertainments and feasted her flatterers, while, without, poor peasants were assembled to gaze in silent wonder upon the magic structure, shivering and pinched in the icy air, the white frost covering their shaggy heads and unshaven beards. Joseph the Second of Austria joined the stately cavalcade. At Kaniev, Stanislaus Augustus, King of Poland, and distinguished Polish nobles swelled the royal train. Catherine had not met her old lover for twenty-three years, and for once her imperturbable countenance betrayed agitation. Poniatowski, however, retained his composure, and did homage to the Empress for the crown she had bestowed upon him, with as little emotion as if they had been strangers. This royal cortege sailed down the Dnieper in a fleet of fifty galleys. Potemkin had spared no expense, and no device by which to astonish and impress the beholders with the state of the countries through which they passed. He dressed up shepherds and shepherdesses to attend choice flocks along the banks of the river. Palaces and whole villages were erected to give life to the scenery. Peasants were handsomely attired, troops were newly equipped, Tartars were clothed and disciplined, wildernesses were converted into blooming gardens, Everything that human ingenuity could invent had been gathered here to make the sterile deserts and the wide tracts that had been laid waste in the rapacious wars assume the appearance of populous, thriving provinces. The people, furnished with holiday dresses and engaged with music and dancing, were made to appear gay, happy, and contented, while those very regions were desolate and groaning with famine and oppression. It was an apt illustration of her whole reign, a dazzling display, which she flattered herself 
would blind posterity to her hideous defects, empty and heartless, like everything that emanated from her or her minions. Six months were occupied in this unexampled tour, which resulted in nothing but a renewal of war with the Turks. Hostilities commenced near the close of the same year, 1787, and were encouraged by Prince Potemkin, who, though he seemed to have every possible desire granted, lacked one thing more to give him the happiness he was always in pursuit of, yet never found. He had never received the Order of St. George. This could not be obtained till he had commanded an army and gained victory. Thousands of human beings were thrown into the scale with a ribbon and star. Potemkin must be gratified with the possession of the toy. End of section 34「Section 35 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 35. Catherine of Russia, Part 4. An army of 150,000 men, under the command of the celebrated generals Romanzov, Repnin, and Suvorov, commenced hostilities against the Ottoman Empire, and, during two years, passed from city to city, reducing them to ashes, and inhumanly massacring the inhabitants of whatever age or sex. The fierce Potemkin spared nothing. The lives of his troops were of no account. He simply gave orders from his sumptuous tents, and if everything was not gained that he commanded, he was ready to press his iron heel upon the necks of his own soldiers. Catherine, equally insensible to the rapine, bloodshed, and horrors of war, gave balls and tournaments at her capital, distributed costly gifts among the conquerors, and gave thanks in the churches for their bloody victories. In 1790, Potemkin sat with his armies before Ismail. Seven months passed, at the end of which the besieged still firmly and bravely held out. Potemkin, impatient at the long resistance, ordered it to be taken in three days. Suvorov obeyed, and addressing his men with the brutal words, My brothers, no quarter! Provisions are dear! He began the assault. The Russians were twice repulsed, which added to their ferocity when they afterwards succeeded in scaling the ramparts and gained possession of the city. All the inhabitants were slain, till blood ran in torrents through the streets. Suvorov immediately wrote to the Empress with only these words, The haughty Ismail is at your feet. Potemkin hastened to Petersburg to gain a reward for victories he no more had gained than those for which Alexei Orlov had been enriched. Catherine, however, rewarded him with the coveted ribbon and star, and bestowed upon him a magnificent palace and a coat laced with diamonds. All he desired was now attained, but instead of the happiness he expected to attain, he found himself the most miserable of men. Suvorov and the accompanying generals proudly laid their laurels at the feet of the Empress, who smiled upon them and bestowed estates and glittering jewels on the heroes, as if they were not all bathed in the blood of oppressed victims. This war had cost the lives of more than six hundred thousand men, the destruction of many cities, and the exhaustion of the Russian treasury, while nothing permanent had been gained by either nation. A treaty was soon concluded, but Potemkin did not live to see it accomplished. In the midst of his pleasures and his vices, he was suddenly seized with dangerous illness, and with his usual waywardness, refused the advice of physicians and set out upon a journey. While traveling between Yasi and Nikolsev, he was too ill to proceed, and being taken out of his carriage, was laid upon the grass under a tree, where he quickly expired. Not far from the spot rested the remains of the good Howard. As if, says Dr. Clark, 
the hand of destiny had directed two persons in whom were exemplified the extremes of virtue and vice to one common spot in order that the contrast might remain a lesson for mankind in seventeen ninety two catherine declared war against poland to which she assigned various petty pretexts while in reality it was the result of her own long meditated division of that country her new favorites and ministers gladly acquiesced in a measure that promised them a large share in the rich spoils of the unhappy poles frederick of prussia acting in concert with the empress dispatched an army to unite with the russian legions and together they overran the plains of poland at warsaw the diet had received the declaration of war with stern calmness succeeded by a burst of enthusiasm excited by a patriotic determination to free themselves from the russian yoke defend their homes and save their nation from oblivion an army was hastily summoned and placed under the command of joseph poniatowski a man ill-fitted for such a responsible post nothing but disasters accompanied his efforts the russians were everywhere triumphant the defenders of poland were dispersed their estates confiscated and their families reduced to penury and servitude while poland thus lay bleeding and panting at the feet of the conquerors kosciusko whose name is dear to the lovers of liberty sprang up from the despairing hosts girded on the warrior's armor and with the glorious resolve of rescuing his countrymen and his nation from the haughty victors gathered about him the few bold spirits who dared to offer themselves as a shield to poland peasants whom he caused to be freed from servitude augmented his little army he was chosen their general inspired with the patriotic fire of the brave leader the enthusiastic army swept all before them had their king and his partisans united with their efforts poland might still have had a place among nations but the dissensions that since the accession of stanislaus augustus had rendered united action impossible occasioned the final triumph of russia and prussia catherine had sent fresh troops and frederick stationed himself at the head of his own forces during the last engagement the poles were overpowered the army cut to pieces and the brave kosciusko fell wounded and senseless in the thickest of the battle he was carried a prisoner to petersburg confined in a dungeon till the death of catherine and then brought forth by paul and loaded with honors the emperor offered him employment in the russian service which he declined it is said that paul presented him with his own sword in admiration for the noble pole but kosciusko replied i no longer need a sword since i no longer have a country his soul glowed with the love of liberty melancholy and oppressed at the sight of poland in chains he sought the shores of young america and generously devoted his noble and exalted powers to her cause he was too pure a jewel for a russian setting leaving his revered name associated with the loved washington and lafayette in the struggle for american liberty he repaired to switzerland where he died in eighteen seventeen the poles just awakened to his inestimable worth conveyed his remains to his native land and almost divine honors were paid to his memory to return to the events of seventeen ninety four catherine displaced stanislaus augustus who had not been adroit enough to secure the confidence of either party she sent him to grodno condemned to live obscurely on a pension granted by her and created prince repnin governor of the provinces that fell to her share in the infamous division of poland the following year the empress added another rich province to her empire courland by her intricate and unscrupulous stratagems was secured without having recourse to arms and those who resisted her usurpations were immediately deprived of their estates and sent to siberia the remainder were frightened into submission the death of frederick of prussia deprived her of an assistant in her plots and gave her an enemy in his successor 
she threatened him with war. At the same time, she turned her covetous eyes upon Persia, designing its scepter for Alexander, one of her grandsons. For Constantine, another of Paul's sons, she intended to extend her conquests in Turkey and set him upon the Ottoman throne. Sweden, she determined, should fall to Alexandrina, her favorite and beautiful granddaughter. This princess is described as just fifteen, tall, well-formed, with noble and regular features, a profusion of fine hair, and eyes that beamed with intelligence and sensibility. In person, mind, and manners, Alexandrina was one of the most lovely and accomplished princesses in Europe. Catherine set her heart upon making her Queen of Sweden. To accomplish it, she succeeded in prevailing upon Gustavus Adolphus, the young king of Sweden, to visit her court. He repaired to Petersburg, accompanied by the regent, his ministers, and a brilliant suite, an arrival that occasioned a gorgeous display on the part of Catherine. Gustavus Adolphus was nearly eighteen, of elegant stature, agreeable face, free and graceful manners that were calculated to captivate a free heart. At their presentation, Gustavus and Alexandrina were equally won by the unexpected beauty and grace of the other. The charms of the Russian bell overcame his affection for the princess of Mecklenburg, to whom he was affianced. The engagement was easily broken off, and the fascinating king was soon the accepted suitor of the happy Alexandrina. Articles of marriage were drawn up, the day for the betrothment appointed, and splendid preparations for its celebration occupied all the court. The day arrived, and Catherine, with her officers and attendants, occupied the presence chamber in a style that equaled, if not outvied, oriental magnificence. The Swedish suite, in brilliant court dresses, waited upon their king, and the brilliant circle was completed by the manly presence of the royal groom and the lovely bride, bewitchingly veiled in a mist of costly lace. The Chancellor Markov commenced reading the contract, when, to the surprise of the imperial family, Gustavus interrupted him, and observed that the laws of Sweden required that the princess should change her religion, without which agreement he could not sign the contract. The empress remonstrated, flattered, almost entreated, but the young king was immovable. Not willing to sacrifice her dignity to farther efforts, she coldly arose, and with unaltered countenance, majestically moved out of the apartment, followed by the pale bride and all her attendants. Nothing more was said upon the matter. The following day the Swedish king and his suite quitted Petersburg. Alexandrina, who was the keenest sufferer, had been led to her apartments when she fainted away, and afterwards gave up to a melancholy that was not diverted by her marriage with the Archduke of Austria. She fell into a decline, and died at the age of nineteen. The mortification and disappointment of Catherine had as fatal and a more sudden effect, because of her struggle to suppress her anger and chagrin in the presence of curious spectators. Her temper was too imperious to endure graciously such a slight. Whether it was the occasion of her death or not, she was soon after seized with a fit of apoplexy that terminated her life the 9th of November, 1796. At the height of her guilty grandeur, in the midst of premeditated injustice, her hand raised with threatened violence against unoffending nations, this wicked empress was summoned into eternity without a moment's warning. A happy death, said her subjects. Happy, perhaps, because her soul had made its exit as completely veiled as she had struggled to keep it during her life. The Grand Duke was immediately proclaimed emperor under the title of Paul I. His first duty was to direct the imposing ceremonials of the empress interment. He directed the remains of his father, Peter III, to be disinterred and brought to Petersburg from the church of the monastery of St. Alexander Nevsky, 
where they had quietly reposed for more than thirty years. His coffin was placed beside that of the empress, and his crown, which the unfortunate monarch had never worn, was brought from Moscow and placed above him. Over both lay a kind of true love knot, with the inscription, Divided in life, united in death. Paul, probably from motives of revenge, ordered Alexey Orlov, who resided at Moscow, and Baratinsky, his assistant in the murder of the deceased emperor, to stand one on each side of the corpse of Peter as chief mourners. In the state chamber of the palace, draped with sable hangings, lighted with tapers and filled with courtiers in gloomiest black, these two appointed mourners were obliged to station themselves beside their moldered victim. Alexey Orlov was too strongly nerved to be overcome by this mode of vengeance, but Baratinsky, more sensitive, sank under the doleful task, and it was only by repeatedly applying stimulants that he could be made to keep his station during the three long hours of ceremonials. Count Orlov afterwards received permission to travel without asking it, which is the Russian form of dismissing or disgracing a favorite, who returns to court at the peril of breathing the icy air of Siberia. Catherine II reigned thirty-four years, years full of glory and shame to Russia. Few of her works remained permanently, and much of the good she accomplished was soon overturned under the short and cruel administration of Paul. She was neither loved nor hated by the Russians. So accustomed are they to tyranny that they submissively and meekly yield to whatever their sovereign chooses to enforce. Notwithstanding Catherine's severity and imperious airs, she was not a tyrant in her own palace, but free, easy, and gay. She is described as preserving her grace and majesty to the last period of her life. She was of moderate stature, but well proportioned, and as she carried her head very high, she appeared rather tall. She had an open brow, an aquiline nose, an agreeable mouth, and her chin, though long, was not misshapen. Her hair was auburn, her eyebrows black and rather thick, and her blue eyes had a gentleness which was often affected, but oftener still betrayed pride. Her physiognomy was not deficient in expression, but that expression never discovered what was passing in the soul of Catherine or rather it served her the better to disguise it. She wore the Russian costume, that being the most becoming to her. Green was the color most in vogue with the Russians, and she usually adopted it. Her hair, slightly powdered, flowed upon her shoulders and was surmounted by a small cap covered with diamonds, which gave a coquettish finish to her costume. With a different husband and a more enlightened people, it is hard to say what her fame and fate would have been. As it was, a brazen face and ready dagger were all that she ever needed, and for her use of these alone is she to be credited in seizing and maintaining her great power. She deserves praise for encouraging the literature of her own country and for tolerating all religions. In these respects she was nobly unlike many of her compeers but her private life was disgraced by a licentiousness that she hardly attempted to conceal, and she expended enough energy in empty and ludicrous affectations of enterprise to have made her realm prosperous and glorious in reality instead of occasional appearance. End of section 35